Hello, and welcome to another Noise Blast Hour sponsored by Noise Engineering. I'm Chris, your illustrious host, and I'm very happy to be here today with Sophia Hultquist, also known as Drum and Lace. Drum and Lace is a really amazing uh, solo project by Sophia and known for really dense and just lush uh, field recordings and textures and really gorgeous sounds. Uh, but she's also quite well known for her film scores and she's been shortlisted for an Academy Award. She's done a lot of electronica, a lot of um, moving toward horror movies, uh, all kinds of stuff, and really just accomplished and established, and we're really lucky to have her. We'll talk to Sophie a bit about her career trajectory, how she got where she is, what she's doing, um, what she's got coming, some of the things that she would recommend for people that are interested in getting into film, and a whole lot more uh, after we hear this lovely set, so stay with us. Thank you. 
Okay, Sophie, thank you so much for that amazing set. That was really so much fun to watch, so beautiful. Uh, can you tell us a bit about the set and what you just performed? Yeah, um, so first of all, thanks for having me and thanks for uh, letting me share that performance. Um, so I was trying to figure out the best way to kind of um, kind of showcase a little bit of, you know, the, the sound that I have and like what my performances are usually like. Um, and so I also wanted to obviously perform something from my um, debut record that just came out um, in the spring. So it kind of combines a little bit of that and kind of the more improvisational and experimental um, stuff that I do during my performances. So the beginning of the set starts with an interlude that's uh, part of the record uh, called Sullen, and uh, which is primarily like field recordings in my hometown, um, Florence in Italy. And that kind of transitioned into one of my favorite pieces from the record called Praziano, which if anyone's seen me perform in the last like three years, they've probably seen me do like an improv version of that. And I finally kind of just like recorded it and now, you know, perform, still perform the improv version, but it's a little bit more fleshed out. Um, and then that transitioned into a new improvisation that um, is actually based on an older field recording based thing that I, um, that I recorded years ago as something that I have on YouTube called like live ambient improv. So it used to be an old, um, an old improvisation that used field recordings from the LA Historic State Park um, in Chinatown here in Los Angeles. And it was always a little bit dark. So um, when I was asked to play Tonalism, which was an ambient festival um, at Descanso Gardens in June with Dub Lab, um, I thought that that was the perfect opportunity to like revamp it. So I first performed it there. And then I was like, you know what? I think I can keep kind of like fleshing it out. So I was like, I'm just going to throw this improv in with Preziano because it's kind of like a nice mix of like dark into kind of something a little bit lighter. Um, so that's what ended up happening. So the second part is something that I think I'm going to eventually record, but it was definitely all improvised. Um, same with the vocals and the looping of the vocals and stuff. Um, and yeah, I feel like my record might not seem as field recording heavy, but my performances definitely, I feel like, are. Um, and yeah, and that's usually what I, what I had was very much the setup that I have if you see me live. So like my big pedal board and then my little um, suitcase with my Eurorack friends. <laughs> <laughs> what are your go-to modules? So lately, um, I've really been into... Um, just kind of having generative or having, you know, like I use um, a Qubit Bloom um, to kind of like come up with sequences or um, I actually also use a Surface, um, also Qubit. But then they, I, I like going from like very dry to then running them through some of um, you guys' stuff. Um, and I have a, a Melitus, is, am I saying it right? Melitus and a Dismodus. <laughs> Is I mean, <laughs> Latin, you're probably better at pronouncing Latin than we are. <laughs> yeah, but I feel like those two modules have really helped to kind of spatialize and like expand and kind of add so much dimension. Um, so they're running through that. And that's what I used on um, on this, I believe. And also an endorphins. Um, is it Queen Queen of Cups? Queen of Pentacles? Cups. It's the it's the cup one I can't ah. I can't remember the yeah but though that's kind of like the the essence of what I was using for this particular performance right. um but in general yeah I just feel like I like any module that can 
really kind of, ex- you know, like it, it, what excites me is anything that can um, reverb out or delay or just kind of like do things that are unexpected and I can kind of like rev up and rev down. Um, but yeah. Beautiful. It was such a lovely, lovely performance. I was very lost in it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad it's when you're, when you're in the moment and you're filming, um, especially when you're like self-awarely like filming your own performances, you're like, Oh God, like, is this, I screwed up so bad or like, Oh my God, is this going to be any good? And then it's always a nice surprise when you watch back and you're like, Oh, okay. It still flows. And it's just, you get so like in the moment. And so I don't know. And, and um, I'm glad that I was able to keep it. Cause like some of my, sometimes I feel performances that we're only supposed to be 20 minutes. And then all of a sudden it's 35 minutes later. And I'm like, Oh my God, how am I going to edit this down? <laughs> um, but thankfully I like kind of gave myself a limitation with this performance. Cause I was like, I'd rather have it be like short and sweet. Um, so that's what ended up happening. And I'm, I'm happy with how it turned out. Yeah. It's lovely. Tell us a little bit about your musical background and how you got where you are. Yeah. Um, it's, I, it's been it's been a it's not bumpy but it's definitely not been like a smooth uh road and um I was definitely the kid in high school that you know everyone would say was like the music kid whether it was because I like went to a lot of music shows listened to music constantly um I started singing just kind of for myself when I was super young um took piano lessons like you know a lot of kids kind of like that's their first introduction to music so was lucky enough to have that, but then soon kind of gave that up to try to play the guitar and then like did a few years of playing drums and then played in some bands. And, you know, like, so by the time I graduated from high school, I was kind of like master of none, but like, you know, knew how to play enough like things like rock band um, wise. And I have to say, I'd never, I'd never played a synthesizer. Like I'd been around a lot of DJs and like, I was familiar with kind of more of that, but that was like, as far as like electronics went. Um, but I knew that I liked music enough to try to go to Berklee College of Music in Boston. So like begged my parents to like, you know, if I got in, would you like be able to pay for me to go because it's expensive and, you know, it's like so far away. So I wound up getting into Berkeley somehow. Like I would not have gotten into Berkeley today. I think they were like a lot more lenient um, back then. And I actually had gone to be a rock, kind of like a rock blues singer. Um, And I got there and I like realized that I just like did not have the chops to like be that stage person, you know, to to be the person that like that school um, was going to kind of funnel you into if you were going to be a vocal performer. So I was like, well, my other big passions are uh, film because I grew up, you know, just kind of absorbing a lot of film and stuff like that and um, and theater. And I was like, they have something called film scoring, which I had never even thought about, like. I'm all the way over here and my parents are spending all this money. Like maybe I should just do the major that I know nothing about. So that's kind of how I um, kind of first dove into film scoring, to be honest, because I wasn't, there wasn't, there weren't really that many role models at the time that um, were women. So I'd never even really thought about it as a film career. Um, and I do think that the, you know, there was a lot less people doing it and it just seems so much more niche. So that was my introduction to um, film scoring kind of in general and to technology. And um, once I graduated from Berkeley, like by, by that time, I'd kind of gone a little bit more into synthesis and like uh, my boyfriend at the time, who's now my partner, um, still my partner, um, was in a indie, indie pop band. So there were synthesizers around and um, I kind of started tinkling about with things a little bit more. And that led me to um, try to go to grad school. So I wound up going to NYU for music technology, which um, is still to this day, maybe the hardest thing I've ever done because like wow. it involved so much more math than I think I was aware of. You know, I had to get like a math tutor. We were, you know, doing, you know, solving trigonometric things back and forth because, you know, like sound waves are essentially trigonometry and displacement of like a sound wave off of like, zero so you know all of this stuff and I think that that's really the point where you know if anyone ever comes at me and like leaves a mean YouTube comment being like oh she doesn't know what she's doing I'm like I beg to differ like I do know what's going on maybe I just did a really bad job this time but like (laughs) I have I have the like I have the technical backing to know what's going on here (laughs) you know kind of thing and that 
um, that as much as it was hard, gave me so, so much, uh, empowered me so much to feel um, better about like really jumping into doing electronic music and doing stuff like that. So um, I'm, I feel like I'm relatively, relatively new to kind of really like tech heavy electronic music after having gone to grad school. Um, and, you know, I really like did not want to be doing film scoring after getting out of grad school. So I started working as an in-house composer and kind of doing that stuff um, for a while. And then I started just kind of scoring things without even thinking about it that much for my friends that had fashion brands. And I was in New York at the time. So fashion kind of became this like gateway to building a reel and to starting to do um, more stuff to picture. Um, whether I intentionally did it or not, um, is still, I still think about that. But, you know, it it brought me back into the realm of like scoring and writing music based off of like textures and colors and um, doing stuff for like runway presentations and stuff like that. And that slowly turned into what I'm doing today, um, mainly through a documentary called The First Monday in May, which was um, about a fashion exhibit at the Met uh, Metropolitan Museum in New York. And that was my first um, film scoring credit, my like first bigger kind of like non short film scoring credit. And, you know, it's taken a good eight years since then, but it's just the foundation all in all, as much as like the path was not like a, you know, going from like high schooler to like, I want to be a film composer all the way there. But like, I somehow like got there, you know, through one step or the other. And now I've been in Los Angeles for eight years. Um, and it really takes that this long to like get that, that this kind of career going. Um, and then at the same time, I've been releasing my own music and um, finding that as like a really great outlet um, to the scoring work. But, um, and I do, I do place the same amount of importance in both. Like I could not do my scoring day job without um, having my like personal artist project. Cause that, that fulfills me in such a way that like, I don't think scoring ever will, to be honest um, and vice versa, you know, they serve different purposes. So let's talk a little bit about your drum and lace project. When you, what, what creative energy does that fulfill? So what, what makes a drum and lace project versus what do you consider? I mean, and obviously for a, a, a scoring project, you're, you're kind of hemmed in by what they are telling you they need. But uh, what, what would you say is, is the essence of a drum and lace project that would not be a similar, similarly requested uh, movie project? Yeah. So, I mean, you, you mentioned it, it like completely right that the scope of working in film is, you know, you're, you're essentially, you're hired to fulfill someone else's vision or to kind of like amplify and build upon the film that's there or like, you know, the, the visual that's there. So as much as there's freedoms in it, it's also, you know, it, you're working within, um, a palette that the director or showrunner also likes, or like that makes sense for the film, obviously. Um, so I, the constrictions are kind of nice, you know, for anyone who's an artist and cause sometimes you're just sitting there and you're like, Oh my God, I can do anything. Like, what am I going to do? It is nice to have the limitations of like, you know, that this is what you're going to do. Um, and you know, it, it's fun to work within that. It's like challenging to be like, how can I realize a theme in this short amount of time that's on visual and whatever. Um, so, but at the same time, it's not as freeing and you know, the director might like something, but then if there's a studio involved and they pitch in, you know, ev everything I feel like with film that's super experimental, unless like that's the, the end goal ends up being a little bit watered down just because it has to apply, you know, it has to appease like the masses all in all, you know, like there's, there's an expectation with film that the investors and producers want to make their money back. So you have to also kind of play within those rules a little bit. Like you, you can't, you can't just make like a noise or, I mean, you can in some cases, but for the most part, it's like you're adhering to someone else's creative vision. Um, whereas with my drum and lay stuff, I, you know, I can do whatever I want. Like structurally, I can have it be a minute and a half interlude and then have there be a track that's like got no structure at all, you know, like, or I can follow my own structures. And I just, I, you know, you're just kind of your own boss um, with stuff. But the I think that the the 
passion or just like the 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 stuff that you put into your own project often resonates with directors and with others so it's like they kind of they they definitely influence each other um and i would say my artist my artist music and my own music seeps into the scores more often than like the other way around um and sometimes i'll write something for a record or for myself that then i'm like oh but this could be cool in a film and vice versa you know so there is kind of this like osmosis that happens uh, musical osmosis but I would just say the difference is like full creativity versus like creatively creativity constrained constrained or like kind of kept within the realm of like what works for visual for that specific visual. That makes total sense. I uh, I wanted to ask a little bit kind of off of what you just said. How do you want to be known as a film composer? I know, you know, different composers often have their niches within within composition. So how, how do you want to be known? It's a really good question. I've never, uh, I mean, I guess within, you know, w- within my own music, like recently I came across like that, you know, it was like me Googling like my record to like, see if there was like anything that I'd missed and some, and it had ended up on this like top, uh, albums of 2022 so far, but in like a very specific, um, category which was ambient techno and I'd never thought about it or heard that and I was like oh my god that's such a good such a good way of describing it because it's like it's not and it's always the issue it's like my music is not ambient enough for like the ambient folks but then it's not clubby enough obviously for like (laughs) club or after hours so it lives in this kind of like in between world um so I thought that that was perfect and I think that that kind of applies for scoring stuff as well where it's like I've worked on films where um they want something that's a little bit more organic and like chambery so i've definitely done things that are like chamber and electronics but then a lot of like the most recent stuff that i've done is more like electronics with chamber elements um and you know it's people ask me whether it's a choice or whether it's um you know i'd want to work with orchestral and you know first of all players are expensive and like you know getting big orchestras is expensive so i'm just at the point in my career where it's like that's becoming more feasible uh, to have like 40 players, um, perform on something. But I do think that there's something so nice about, uh, individual strings or like quartet or something like that, that can be, that can be so intimate, but also more disconcerting because it's just like, you're focusing on the sounds of less things. Um, but yeah, I guess like chamber electronic is kind of the, the, what I find myself kind of, um, the projects that come to me with film stuff, they tend to be more kind of like that. Um, even though projects like Dickinson, um, which is a TV show that's on um, on Apple TV Plus, that's a lot more electronic. So like definitely get a lot of um, asks for a more like song, like electronic type of stuff as well. We have so many customers that are interested in film scoring. Do you have any advice that you would give for somebody that is interested in this as a career path? Yes. Uh, I feel like, like I mentioned, as lo- as much as it sometimes sucks to be in a gray area and not be able to be like boxed into something, I think um, for me personally, and I can kind of like now with more time working um, in the industry and kind of like, you know, getting older, like just, you know, with the years that pass, it's like so much of the opportunities have maybe not come as fast, but they've come because I've always kept what I do very authentic. And it's like, there's not much that I've worked on even film wise that you wouldn't be like, oh, that makes sense for her sound. You know, I think that it's great to tell yourself when you're starting out, um, I can do any genre. I can do John Williams style. I can do Hans Zimmer, but it's like, at the end of the day, when someone wants to hire you for a film or for a TV show, they don't want to hire a jack of all, tr- you know, they, they want somebody that has a specific sound and that can bring something refreshing and interesting. So I think just like from the beginning, yes, sure. Make it be known that you're not, you know, like I, if I, if I wanted, if somebody really wanted like a full orchestral score, I'm sure I could figure it out. But like my strengths are really, I know what my strengths are and I really just kind of try to go for those. So I would encourage anyone who's starting out as a composer to just really find their strengths and what feels comfortable to them and what they think is still challenging, but, you know, and just start 
honestly start writing your own music like put some music out like nobody wants to hire somebody who has like no music on spotify or no music on soundcloud like even if it's like just soundcloud just like having music examples up of like what you like to write i think that that's like that's um advice that i wish somebody had given me sooner um because people are looking for unique voices now they're not looking for somebody that can just do everything or sound like someone else especially right if they wanted john williams they'd go to john williams so exactly exactly yeah <laughs> that's great that's really fantastic advice and i think that's going to go a long way for a lot of our customers thank you i hope so i also wanted to ask you i know having we talked to a lot of composers and i know that a lot of them talk about the difference between scoring to picture versus I don't know what the name of not scoring to picture is, um, <laughs> but just sending music in. Uh, how do you find the, the, the difference in co- those different types of composition? And do you have a preference or uh, what do you think about those? In terms of like working on a, on a visual project still though? Or... Yeah, on, on any sort of film where you have, have to score that either you are scoring to picture or they're just saying, here's, here's a description of the just scene. Write something. Yeah. Um, honestly, I think that when um, I've been lucky enough to be hired on projects recently where I'm brought in on the script phase, so like before they start shooting, which is a really great thing because you get to establish the sound of something before there's a visual so that then I think that there's like a congruency that happens um, that's just kind of more solid from the beginning instead of being brought on like once there's a director's cut and think you know things are so set in stone. And being brought on earlier also means that there might end up being less temp um, temp music, which means that like everyone is less tied to something sounding a specific way. Um, so then the then the thing that I've gone kind of into the habit of doing in the last couple of years is that when I get brought onto a project, even if there is visual, I'll usually write like a suite, you know, uh, a suite or a couple, depending on like how inspired I am. But, you know, it'll be anything from like five to nine minutes long. And it'll just kind of explore different emotions and try to set up a palette. Because that's really kind of the best way to send a director or to send someone this piece of music that's written not to picture, but based off of like what you've gotten from it. Um, And very often that helps give, you know, make everyone feel more confident about like what's going on, but then also just kind of help you as a composer establish like what your palette and what your sound is going to be like and show kind of what you think could be a good development. and also it's always easier to talk about music when there's something to talk about rather than just talking abstractly about what you're going to do. Yeah. Um, so that's been super helpful. And then I've been able to use that suite and just kind of start play, you know, when you start working on the project, you can start placing it in the film and seeing how it works and uh, the editors can start putting it into the film so that then when you're actually scoring, scoring it, your, your sound is already in there. So then if you have to copy your, you know, like, if you have to copy yourself, then you end up, you know, that's fine. Instead of having to like replace, you know, an Alexander Desplat piece that like you've fallen <laughs> in love with and you're like, I'm not Alexander Desplat. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, so I, I kind of like to write based off of how a script or, um, a you know, like a lookbook or even like some raw footage looks like, but, um, but of course, I've also just straight up just always, you know, also scored just a picture. So, um, but there's, I don't know. I, I like doing the suites. I think it's helpful. That sounds awesome. I would really love that. And then you could just pull motifs if you need to, or just. Yeah. That's yeah. Brilliant. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> when you are on the road, do you do any composition? And it sounds like you're not currently on the road a whole lot but when you do travel do you compose and if so what's your mobile rig like um what's your process like on the road and how does that differ from when you're at home yeah so i i have to say that i do try to plan travel around moments when i don't have work um just because it is very it, it is a lot of work to put a mobile rig together um but i did have to work on stuff when i had to go um to chicago in april and the mobile rig is essentially just like a, a very powerful laptop because like that's kind of like the most important thing, you know, I have is just like a, you know, a Mac Pro. Um, I have started using, I can't remember the name of the app, but uh, an iPad as a second screen. And that's been super helpful because it's like, 
that way you can put picture on it and kind of have it sync. Um, and I do use a program called video sync, which is really nor normally in the studio and on the road, which is kind of like a standalone, um, application that you load your video into. And so it doesn't take up like the CPU of your DAW, you know? And nice. so that's nice because then I can just kind of like put that screen onto my iPad and, um, that makes it so that I still have the double screen situation that I have here. Um, I have a TV like up top here and then like a curved big screen that I'm looking at you, um, on. And then, um, I have like an Apollo, um, interface just you know like a, a little interface that has i think it has two xlr or quarter inch ins and outs just because i try to not do too too much other recording um i'll always have um a microphone usually just an sm58 because i don't it's it's becomes a lot to start bringing really nice mics with you as well so just you know an sm58 um a bunch of pedals usually you know whether it's um a blue sky or like a Maris uh, Mercury seven, or just like something that can be like a nice external reverb. Mm -hmm. um, I will sometimes bring, um, you know, like a little skiff like this for my modular stuff. If I really want to bring something and, you know, these, these fit in a backpack. So, you know, you can just kind of like throw those in with your laptop. And that's just helpful because sometimes if you do feel constrained to doing stuff in the box, it can feel really limiting after working on a project with like all of your equipment. So I think that bringing that has, even if I don't end up using it, it's just nice to know that I have it, even to just be able to like improvise or just do something um, kind of like that. And then um, obviously just like invest in a really nice pair of headphones because I, I do not, um, unless it's for, I'm assuming, you know, for more than like three weeks, it's just, I just don't usually bring any um, speakers with me because then that's just, you know, so much more, especially if then you're traveling to a foreign country and then you have to worry about like plugging everything in. Um, so I keep it really, really bare bones. Um, and maybe the last thing that also fits in a backpack is bringing something like this, um, you know, to do kind of like automation or to do mm. um, stuff. And, you know, these are, this is like a cord nano control too. And it's just this, you can use for a bunch of stuff and for um, volume and for, um, you know, if you're doing orchestral samples for different CC controls and um, and stuff like that, but um, really keep it very, very bare bones. And again, I try not to travel when I know that I'm in the middle of work unless I have to. <laughs> that makes sense that yeah. particularly for what you do, it just seems like it would be hard to pick up and move in the middle of a project. Yeah. And in the past, I've definitely brought um, just like a little Pelican's worth of pedals, skiff, whatever, if I feel like I need, you know, if I'm not on a film project, I usually bring stuff anyway, just in case I get inspired and I want to just like improvise jam or whatever. Um, so that's always been nice to just kind of like have something um, with me, but. Yeah, but yeah. We're, it's pretty rare that we go anywhere without some module case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For a family trip that we took, or it was, it was kind of a work and family trip um, in June it was like, do we bring um, a suitcase of like an extra suitcase of clothes or do I bring my Pelican and the Pelican one, even though it's more <laughs> heavy. And obviously TSA is always really um, happy to see a case full of cables and stuff. Um, oh, yeah. But, you know, even though I didn't really use it, it was worth it. Because what if I did? What if I needed it? <laughs> <laughs> we flew into Germany for Superbooth one year and the security was very unhappy about the modules. And so I had to explain, and I speak no German, so I was trying to explain to the guy who spoke limited English what I had, and eventually I settled on, it's a musical instrument. And he said, mm -hmm. oh, like a flute? And I was like, yes, like a flute. <laughs> yeah, what, the conclusion I usually get to is they're like, oh, are you a DJ? And by that point, I'm like, yes. Yes. No, no offense, like nothing against DJing, but like, if that's, what's going to let you just like, let me through, I am a DJ and yes. just let me and my cables through, please. Yes. And don't take it apart. That's the other <laughs> thing. When you like Tetris in all of your stuff into a Pelican and then they start just like willy nilly taking it out. You're just like, oh my God, how am I going to reassemble this? And now with like a two and a half year old in tow, <laughs> you're like, oh my God, how am I going to do this? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's really fun. 
So we've talked a little bit about some of the different um, soundtracks that you've done, like Dickinson, and um, you've also did Good did Good Girls. Um, there's and anybody that's watching, you can check all of these out on Spotify. They are really wonderful. And these are kind of in that vein of that lush and dense and really beautiful types of soundtracks. But lately, you've also been making a bit more of a foray into horror movies. Like so, you had the Night Teeth soundtrack. Um, and now you have a Blumhouse uh, horror movie coming out. Um, mm -hmm. So um, let's talk a little bit about that transition to doing horror, which because I imagine that's a very different process from what you normally do. And how did you find that? Yeah, it's it definitely, you know, um, yes and no. I feel like the my music to me has always felt a little bit darker than um, the type of stuff that for example, I was doing on both Good Girls and Dickinson um, and just kind of like the, you know, whether it's documentary stuff or like, um, I don't know, I've, I've always felt like I've gravitated towards darker stuff. And with film, it's really hard because it, a lot of times you don't get hired for something unless you've done it before, but then you can't get experience for it unless you do it. So it's like this catch 22. So uh, Night Teeth was super fun because it was a little bit like, it was a little bit of like treading that line between doing score that could be kind of like a song or a track, but then it was also horror. So that was, you know, horror, horror elements. Um, so that was really fun. Um, and I co-scored that with my partner, um, Ian Holtquist and, um, that then led, or maybe I'd already been brought on, um, to a project called cobweb, which, um, doesn't have a release date yet, but it's a lion's gate horror movie. Um, and it's terrifying. And it's by this French director who's amazing. And um, I somehow, you know, I demoed for that and somehow like got it. I mean, I think my agent at the time and the folks at Lionsgate really advocated for me. And so that was kind of like my beginning. I'm starting to work on that. But then that movie, like a lot of stuff during pandemic and just in general kind of got put on hiatus. Um, and now we've finished it, but you know, there's no release date, but that kind of got my feet wet with like actual horror and kind of what that was. Um, and then that led to me getting a movie that um, is out um, August 5th. So yes, it's going to be out by the time um, this air is called They Slash Them, which is a Blumhouse film and it's uh, streaming on Peacock. And it's interesting because that film is, um, it's about, it's, it's a slasher film that takes place at an LGBTQ conversion camp. And um, it's got a lot of heart and it's a kind of a story about empowerment, but there's definitely like slasher and horror elements. So, the, you know, it's kind of like having to be like heartfelt, but then also have the horror moments. Um, and I feel like between those two, I really now want to just keep doing horror because I feel like it's a genre that works really well with like electronics. So, you know, being able to do weird stuff with modular um, especially with like percussion or stretching things out. And then I love working one-on-one -on -one with string players. Um, so for both of those films, I worked with a cellist um, called Ro Rowan and they're absolutely wonderful. And they're just, they're just so talented and such a joy to work with. And you really like their work. Yeah. And we, you know, would do sessions before starting to score. So, you know, I would have them just kind of give them parameters, be like, okay, do, key of C eight bars at 120 of this texture of this thing. And then once you have that, you can kind of manipulate. So for they slash them and for cobweb, um, a lot of the strings were kind of in there before we did like a scoring session. And then I mocked up, you know, bigger sections with like Spitfire stuff and stuff like that. But having the essence of it be, um, you know, these like string samples that I manipulated and then um, doing sessions on Eurorack, um, doing sessions with my voice. Um, because I mean, and this, this kind of goes back to the conversation about like um, the flow of like my own music versus film. And um, I do find that when I write for film, I do use a lot more in the box stuff or at least like doing these sampling sessions is great because then I have those sounds um, because a lot of times you have to do, you know, revisions or like the, the cut changes. And if you have just spat something out from your, um, you know, a bunch of modules, then either you don't touch the modules until you're done with the movie and you're like, oh my God, I can like change a thing because if I have to do revisions or you just sample things, you know? So I've definitely sampled some, some like drum sounds that I made in uh, BIA, for example, you know, and, and just, then you just have them 
um, and you can plug them in, whether it's like as audio or you can play them on a keyboard um, because I might not be able to get that sound again because God knows what kind of nudging I did, especially if you're talking about like three or four modules and you're like, I don't have even taking photos. It's like impossible to (laughs) recreate anything. Um, But yeah, so horror has been surprisingly liberating and like it's made me less scared of the genre because I've always been like the biggest scaredy cat. (laughs) <laughs> Whereas now working, you know, like watching it silent is still scary, but then it's like a challenge to myself to like scare myself again with nice. music. Um, and I just, I just love it. I just love, um, I think the other thing that I really love about it is the contrast of silence and loud, you know, the dynamic com- component of it, because it's just so much of horror is like jumps or like quiet to like loud and just, you know, um, how loud can you go kind of thing. <laughs> Yeah, you have had so many projects. You have so much happening right now, which is incredible for anybody, and particularly given that everything's been on hold. And it's really impressive to see how much you're getting, how much work you're getting. And it's well. First of all, thank you for making the time to be here because that oh you God, clearly have so much, uh, but. Uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, how you fit all of that in being because you're also a mom. And so you you have a lot on your plate. Um, So how does all of that being being a woman being mom? How does that all fit in with uh, your experience as a film composer? So it's, uh, it's definitely like a game of kind of exclude not not exclusion but you know there's and I've mentioned this in in the past and in like interviews and whatever but you know I remember one scene there's like a triangle that's like social life health and work and it's like you know I think that for me it's more of like a square because then if you add also like children you know like family um which I think is separate from health and from social um and I think you know it's one of those like pick two or three at a time Um, And of course, because of having such a young child, uh, I have a daughter who's two and a half, that's definitely one of them. So then if you look at the rest of the circle, you're like, okay, so which one can I focus on after that? So, you know, it's usually ends up being when I'm busy with work, it's usually like work and family. And then maybe I can seep in like a little bit of social, a little bit of health. Um, But it's definitely hard to get all those things in. And I think um, you know, I think the pandemic has taught us a lot, but I still feel like the thing that I kind of take for granted is health. So I definitely like get into these great rhythms of like working out and going to the gym. And then the moment I get busy, that's completely unmanageable. And that feels like something that's so selfish that that, that goes out the window, unfortunately. Uh, thankfully, then you have a two and a half year old just you're chasing around. So you're like, well, that has to count for something in terms of like, um, the the biggest challenge I think um, since becoming a parent, which I also became a parent like a week into the pandemic, so don't know how much of it is like parenthood and how much of it is just like the world shutting down um, <laughs> or you know that happening at the same time. But I think it is really it is really hard to be a spontaneous, especially with like meeting up with friends or being able to like take on um, you know, performances, because a lot of the time I tend to perform very late. Um, I've performed at like after 11 p.m. more times than I've performed earlier than 11 p.m. So then, you know, that kind of stuff becomes a little bit harder when then you know that the next day you're kind of going to be groggy as hell and you're just it's not going to be fun the next day, even without drinking, even without anything. Um, so I think it's just becoming a parent or like being a, a mom musician or film composer. It's just it just comes down to prioritizing. Um, and to having people around you that understand these priorities and who understand that if you can't go get a drink with them on a whim, that it's not to please keep trying, like, please just like understand that it's like our friendship isn't based on just that. It's like, you know, um, and but it's definitely been challenging. And I'm lucky that I can afford childcare and have my kid in um, preschool, you know, in her preschool and have a partner that's very supportive and, you know, does a really good job with that. But there's definitely been times in the last two and a half years when it's like, oh no, they might've gotten exposed to COVID and now they have to stay home for 10 days. And you're like, but we both, you know, my partner and I both work full time. Like, how are we going to do this? And, and it's hard, but I think you, you know, we're very privileged um, 
in that, you know, we have with childcare and we have a nice home and like things like this. So we, you know, you just, you end up just making it kind of work. Um, and as much as it's hard, you know, I, I was terrified of starting a family because I was like, oh my God, you know, like there's all this momentum that, you know, we talked about like how long it's taken to kind of get here. And you're like, oh my God, am I going to throw that all away? Like, are people going to think about you differently? And it's like, one just has to do what one wants to do. And then you figure it out. And, um, and yeah, and that it's not like a scary thing. I think people can have a family and have a career, um, especially when it comes to like film scoring. But I think that that's a much more feasible career than being like a touring musician um, for, at this point. But, you know, if you make kind of like not super, super tourable music like I do, <laughs> it's kind of OK. Um, but yeah, it's it, but on the flip side, I, f I feel very inspired by my kid, you know, and again, not everyone wants to have children and that's fine. But for me, I always knew that I did. And I do feel like my record is kind of um, as a result of having like a creative burst from strangely enough, having there be this like new creature who was learning to see things for the first time, you know, like um, I'll never forget the first time, you know, at, like Apple, Apple TV, TV does those like screensavers um, of like animals or of like um, nature. And I'll never forget the first time that my daughter saw there's one where there's like seals and literally her face when she saw a seal for the first time, just like swimming in the water was like so inspiring. Cause like, imagine never having seen something like that. And then all of a sudden, so like I've absorbed a lot of that. Um, and I feel like my record is a lot of like that externalized um, in a way. So it's, it's not all hard and it's not all bad and it's, a lot of good and but it's just it's definitely challenging um it does not seem to have slowed you down at all given as we said all of the things you have coming uh yeah but you know you just mentioned natura let's let's talk a little bit about that album because it is really beautiful i bought the vinyl Thank um you. because yeah. it's uh <laughs> it's a rare album that was just so beautiful in both in the sleeve and in the like the vinyl itself um sophia put out both a clear vinyl and a chartreuse vinyl and then a normal and i didn't get there in time for the chartreuse one but i got the clear one and i know is, i only okay. have like a handful of copies myself that are like my prized possession they yeah. they were just they're stunning um and it's just such you know there's the visual but of course we you know it's it's a record so you want to listen to it it is really beautiful to listen to um what was the writing process what were the inspirations for that album um what what tell us about natura so um as i mentioned earlier a lot of my work um stems from or kind of is, is inspired by a lot of natural elements um but what's also been interesting to me and i think this might be from just um the more like academic or like technical side of things is just this idea that like a field recording is like a ca you're capturing a moment of like a natural sound but then it's getting digitized and then it's like how organic does a digital recording remain comp you know like that this kind of like it's it's you know you can spiral really deep into thinking about how um we talk about like instruments as being organic versus um you know, not organic or electronic, but then once it gets recorded, like what's the, you know, at, at what point is a guitar, an acoustic guitar acoustic if then it's recorded and digitized and whatever. So the the record is a lot about um, not fooling the listener, but more like making the listener aware or like just having the listener wonder, like, is that uh, a synthesizer or is that a bird or is like is this like a natural sound or is it synthesized because sometimes you just can't tell um you know like there's a a track called canary and it's got a lot of like clicking and a lot of sounds and um it's actually clicks and stuff from a beluga whale but they sound like modular or they say you know so it's like that that kind of juxtaposition of like what's artificial and what's not and that kind of seeps then into the cover art where it's like um, I wanted it to look kind of like a photo, like it could be a real environment, but then it's obviously all like rendered. There's like nothing real about it. You know, it's all artificial. Um, and I, you know, all of that. And one last um, example is in Creatura, which is the opening track. 
um, the rhythmic pulse is actually a sonogram of my daughter. And it's like, <laughs> but you wouldn't think that, but you know, that's, that's capturing one of the most like natural and like organic things that you can, but then it sounds completely digital and it sounds completely digitized because it's like the way that a machine has read some, the most like natural and thing that has been happening for millennia, you know, kind of thing. Did so you just I think that, take a handheld recorder into the room with you or how did you record that? Yeah. As, um, as I was like going into labor, I, um, I like recorded the monitor. <laughs> I mean, listen, you do, yes. when you hear a sound, you hear a sound. And you, if you always have like a recorder of some sort on you, even if it's just an iPhone, like gotta, you gotta, gotta <laughs> yeah, you gotta capture what you can. Um, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Go on. No, 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 no. But you know, but this is exactly the kind of thing where it's like, you know, nobody would know. And that's kind of been the fun thing to be able to like talk to people. Like, you know, like we're chatting right now about like what's in it. Um, because I don't think people realize how much of it is actual like natural sound that's just sounds like something else. You know, I think everyone can tell that like the beginning of Moss is bells, but it's like it's cowbells. So it's like I went up to like a bunch of cows and was like, let me record you bunch of cows with your like cowbells. Um, uh, but the but yeah, the record, I'm I'm super happy with how it turned out. And it's the evolution of it also going kind of like a little bit from more like rhythmic and more upbeat into something a little bit more um, not necessarily melancholy, but like slowing down a little bit. And then uh, Plante, which is the very last track um, that the London Contemporary Orchestra performs strings on. And this amazing percussionist called Valentina Magaletti um, performed percussion and drums on um, is a track that I've been performing live as an improvisation forever. Um, and it's very, I, th I think of all the tracks as maybe the most hopeful. Um, so I wanted it to end on like a hopeful, a hopeful kind of like um, last little thing. Um, and it just felt like, you know, it's called plante, like essentially plant in Latin. I thought that that was a nice way to close out um, the record video. Yeah, I mean, I could talk about it for forever and ever, but it was um, so plante and Prasiano and sorry, I'm like looking at the, the list of it. Um, a bunch of them have existed for maybe three, three or four years because they started as improvisations. Um, but then the rest of them were written kind of between um, August 2020 and um, like February 2021. Because the record was done, the record was done like a good year, nearly a year before I put it out. Because um, I really wanted to find a good home for it. I really wanted to work on the artwork um, and just have it all be really like make sense together. It's, and, and anybody that, um hasn't heard it you should go listen to it we'll link to it in the description below um, yeah go. and let me know which one your favorite is it's always <laughs> great to it's because it, there's so many different moods and so many different things it's always interesting to hear what everyone's favorite track is um so yeah and it's been all over the place so there's no right or wrong answer but um i was really curious <laughs> uh, okay well so we have one last very important burning question um and i feel like as an Italian, this is a really pressing question to ask you in particular. Uh, we at Noise Engineering are big fans of carbs, and so this is uh, about to become the standard question that we ask all performers. But um, our parting question for you is, uh, what is your favorite pasta? So um, it's, it's a tough call because I feel like it's a toss-up between two different types of pasta and being Italian, I feel like this pressure to have it be like the, the right pasta, but I do think that a really, really good um, spaghetti alla carbonara, like if somebody can make like, you know, like a Roman style, like carbonara, that's like perfect, like egg cooked and bacon and all of that stuff, then I'll go with that. Um, se close second are bucatini alla matriciana, which is like a tomato, um, oniony, like sauce and the the type of pasta is bucatini that has it's like spaghetti but has a hole in it so i think that's a close second but I, i'd say a good carbonara is like if you can get that then that's like absolutely incredible bucatini is um the standard here that is yeah yeah good y yeah you guys know what's up you guys really do <laughs> <laughs> amazing um, okay, so we've already talked about the things that you have coming. Um, where can people find you if they want to, if they haven't somehow learned, listened to you and they want to listen to your music, where can they find you? Uh, so I have music, I think on 
most platforms that anyone would look up, but obviously um, on Spotify and Apple Music. Um, I've got some stuff on SoundCloud, um, all on drum and lace uh, with an ampersand, even though I'm pretty sure if you just spell it out and it should also come up. Um, I have stuff on Bandcamp too, um, including merch and whatnot. And my record is actually on um, this really great ambient vinyl label called Pass Inside the Present, who released um, Natura. And um, you can find them on Bandcamp as well um, under pitp.bandcamp.com. And I also have a YouTube if you want to see any music videos or like I have some like now older like kind of technical videos and some like improv jams and stuff like that. Um, but people tend to connect with me on there. And then I'm very, I'm pretty active on social media. So if you, um, you know, want to say hi, Instagram is always great um, at Drum and Lace. Same thing on Twitter at Drum and Lace. So I'm, I'm around, I'm around on the interwebs, um, kind of everywhere, but definitely um, Bandcamp if you want to buy music and then Spotify, Apple Music, um, everywhere else, right? everything else. And we'll link to all of those in the description below. So make sure that you check out her music if you okay. haven't. And even if you have, go check it out again because it's worth listening to. Um, yeah. Sophie, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been, first of all, it's been so much fun, but it's also been such an absolute pleasure to have you on the show because we're all such fans here and it's just, and you're just such a lovely person to have on. It's just, it's been a complete joy to have you. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity and it's been so lovely to chat with you. Um, yeah, and I look forward to more from you guys and more of like, every, you know, collaborations with everyone, so... Yay. <laughs> well, that's it for this installment of the Noise Blast Hour, sponsored by Noise Engineering. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been our pleasure. And if you haven't already listened to Sophie's music, make sure that you check it out. Everything is linked down in the description. While you're poking around that description, make sure you like and subscribe to our channel. That way you never miss another Noise Blast and you don't miss out on any news from Noise Engineering. We'll see you next time.